Shalom, shalom, Ishpaka. This is Yara Yao checking in. And it's <laughs> a lot of stuff going on right now, so you'll have to forgive the Zuko ponytail, right? I know y'all know who Zuko is. And also forgive the red shirt and the Zuko ponytail. This is not a, <laughs> this is not like a, um, a thumbs up for Avatar, because that is a for sure evil show. Um, but forgive the ponytail and the red shirt. Um, it's not a reference. Okay. Um, so this is going to be a weird video. Yeah, I mean, there's no other way to say it. Uh, those that know, know, and those that don't, don't. Um, but we're going to talk about it. Okay. So if you believe that the earth is round, you are in a cult. You are a part of a cult in a very similar sense to Scientology, right? It's the original cult that Scientology was branched off of. That's the cult that you're in if you believe that the world is round, right? If you believe that the world is round, then you believe in a multiplicity of worlds, right? You believe that not only is there an Earth, but there's also you know, eight, nine other planets in this solar system. And then in this solar system, there's bunches of older, I'm sorry. And other solar systems, there's bunch bunches of planets, excuse me, in this vast ocean of space, right? Of nothingness, right? And so if that is the concept of heaven that you believe in, then you're a member of a cult. And that's, there's no way around, there's no sugarcoating it, there's no, you know, you know, presenting it as anything other than what it is. You are a member of a science-based cult in which, in this, you know, era, the science is not at all science, but a philosophical rendition of a world based on um, false mathematical equations, right? And so let me just do a little bit of backstory just to, to get you to understand why this is the case, right? And in order to do that, people of whom that this is unfamiliar, that this information is unfamiliar, may have a hard time swallowing, you know, so many loaded phrases all at once. <laughs> Believing the, the earth is round is being a part of a cult kind of hard thing to swallow if you're just running on up on this information but let me explain and so you know back in the day we've, we've talked about how the hebrews went into captivity around the 16 15 1600s again from africa into a severe and deep captivity in america right our people our ancestors um in the slave trade and so we also recognize at that time, the holders of the knowledge of Elohim were taken out of the equation. They were actually taken out a few hundred years or 200 years earlier um, from Europe. So the people in Europe, uh, once they got a hold of the maps of the stars and all of the, um, the Maseroth, right? Then they began to analyze it and predict, and then they were able to use it in the way that, the same way that the Hebrews were able to use it. But of course they used it to come up with additional scientific theories to disprove what it actually is, right? And so this is how they did that. <laughs> so people had been playing around with the concept of the ether. People didn't used to even believe that there was such thing as space. People didn't call it space, they called it ether. And they said, well, how big is it? How, you know, what is it made up of? Is it like water? Is it air? You know, these concepts were danced around. Hey, what's going on, son? Do we have what? Antiquities of the Jews. Yes, we have the first one. What do you need it for? You have it. You already have it. Yeah, so um so people were say hey. 
Okay. All right, going back in there. So people were throwing around the idea that the Earth was situated in some sort of liquidy, airy, plasma -y, you know, just anything other than what was the actual, right? And so the theory of space and planets and, you know, billions of years actually evolved from this. We all believe that <laughs> that this concept that we see was just, hey, they looked up at the sky and then understood. No, no, they. it was generations that they developed this concept into what it is today. And, and really what we see today is a still developing, you know, lie that has just gotten deeper and deeper and deeper into the lie, right? So what we that's the thing that we believe in is a deep lie is what is what we're saying, right? And so when we when we look at uh the progression of thought that goes from there, this deep lie. And now you have to understand that they they understand that it's a, it's a lie. And so the original concepts that they came up with all failed, right? The original lies that they tried all failed. The concept of the ether failed. The concept of of close bodies failed because they believed that the stars were still huge, but very, very close, right? And so all of these different, you know, adaptations as to what is in the heavens um, failed until you started to have people like Isaac Newton come along, right? These scientists out of uh, and when you call them scientists, they are not that. If you know anything about Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton was a warlock, right? He was a, a witch. He knew more about the Bible than he did about physics. <laughs> he knew the Bible backwards and forwards. He knew all these ancient texts backwards and forwards. He spent more time in the Bible doing biblical research than he did doing physics research. You look these facts up yourself. Isaac Newton did more biblical research than he did physics research. But he was this guy and he was a witch and he was joined into all of these different secret societies and high societies. And what he actually did was create a mathematical language, right? A mathematical language called calculus, right? And you guys, Correct me if I'm wrong, um, but the mathematical language that he came up with is called calculus. And he called it calculus. Here you go. Why? Because it's hard. <laughs> calculus means hard. Because <laughs> it's difficult, right? People always think these things are very complicated or, you know, far-fetched, you know, concepts. Um, but they're not. They're just words. Calculus is Latin for hard, and so that's what he called it. Sounds like a big compl complicated word, but it's not. It's just a language. It's a language that's written with symbols and numbers instead of letters that are pre-assigned, right? That's what calculus is. And, it, and just like in English, you can describe things with calculus. So you can describe things mathematically. They call it mathematically, but it's, you know, really just a different language, just using different things to to denote, um, you know, divisions of measurement and, and what is true and what is false, right? And so calculus being a language um, is, and this is the other thing that people don't recognize about mathematical languages, is that you can lie in them, right? In a mathematical language, you can lie. And so how is that possible? People, you know, will tell you, okay, well, math is math. Two plus two equals four in no matter what world you live in, right? There's no mathematical equation that can lie to you. Well, that's what you think. <laughs> because there is. Have you ever heard of a negative number, right? Can you have in your hand a negative number? No, you can't. You say, oh, okay, well, the negative number is a concept that's in place for debt, right? Sure, absolutely. But that's a concept, a concept that has to be described in a language. 
It's not something that actually exists, right? It's a concept. Now, can you describe concepts that don't exist, right, with numbers? Yes, you can. You people that have taken algebra and calculus and pre-calculus will be familiar with imaginary numbers. Have you guys ever heard of imaginary numbers? Um, yeah. So you have to, now, and forgive me if I'm forgetting imaginary numbers, but in order to solve a problem, in order to divide a negative number, now you can't divide a negative number because the negative number doesn't exist, right? But in the world of calculus, in the world of pre-calculus, it can exist because you can just put that little I next to it and then understand that it's imaginary, make it positive, and then finish the equation, right? And so there are lots of little tricks like that in calculus, in pre-calculus, that can solve an equation with an imaginary answer. And that imaginary answer will have that little, little swivelly I, a little cursive I next to it, so that the person will know that this is a theoretical answer, that it is an imaginary answer, that's a concept answer of something that doesn't actually exist in real life, right? This is how you lie in a mathematical language. You have that little I. So what if you erase that little I, right? What if you just solve the equation and the equation is so complicated that nobody knows that that I is there? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And nobody, that somebody's peeking. And nobody, not one of my kids. <clears throat> what if you have um, in the equation the need for a lowercase cursive I and it's just not there, right? See, this is what Isaac Newton did. He just finished an equation for a universe that didn't exist. Do you see what I'm saying? And so Isaac Newton is famous for the theory of gravity, right? And so in the theory of gravity, he's using a mathematical formula to explain the speed at which everything is moving around in the sky, right? And so in order to do that, he had to come up with an atmosphere for all of these things to be true, right? And in doing that, because of the different speeds and because of the way that they moved in the sky, he made the assumption that they were all moving based off the same mechanism and their distances and sizes depended on that mechanism, which is called gravity, right? So gravity for the universe is the lowercase i, which makes it imaginary because it's an assumption. The concept of gravity is an assumption based off of the assumed sizes and distances from the things that we see in the universe. You have to understand that the assumption comes first and then based off that assumption, the distances and sizes are then assumed. Not the other way around. Not we know the distances and sizes, and then because of that, we, we formulate the force behind it. It's the other way around. It's we somehow understand the force, and because we understand the force, we know the distances and sizes. Now, if you can understand that, that's kind of putting the cart before the horse, right? Or actually having a cart and assuming that the horse is already there. You see what I mean? But do you understand what I'm saying? So in doing this, he's creating the universe around it. Since this distance has to be true for this star to be moving in this way, then there must be that distance, right? Do you see what I'm saying? This then creates the entire universe to situate gravity in in order for it to spin and revolve and do all the things that supposedly we see it doing in the sky. Instead of it being just a flat disk with small dots, um, 
circulating around the top of the earth inside of the firmament and then uh, two luminaries, the sun and the moon, sent to make a time piece. Well, if this sun is moving at this speed um, based on gravity, it must be this size and this far away. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see what I'm saying? So it builds from the theory, it builds the universe around itself, right? And this is what we mean by belonging, be, belonging, belonging to a cult, because the concept of heaven, even if it's mathematical in nature, is a lie, is a lie that is reproduced by the imaginary concept of gravity, right? The imaginary force that that we can't prove is anything different from air pressure on Earth. You know, heavy things go down because of the air pressure around it, right? You can't, you know, just um, swim to the bottom of the ocean without pushing yourself down unless you're heavy. The pressure around it falls, pushes it down and pushes it downward. That's exactly what you would see in a closed environment, a distinct amount of air pressure, you know, the higher and the lower that you go. In a closed environment with air closed inside a space, you would expect a pressure gradient. You don't expect a pressure gradient in an open environment, right? That's why you have to come up with this concept of gravity because of the pressure gradient. If the environment is open, there's no need for you to be pushed down, right? But if the environment is closed, then there is a necessity to be pushed down because the pressure pushes you down because any enclosed space will have air pressure, right? Do you guys understand what I'm saying? So the need for to, to disprove the actual environment you're in, in itself, the lie created a much bigger lie. And so in order to describe all these things and see, since you have the mathematics of calculus, which you can put that imaginary number or that imaginary sign in, put it in or not, right? It was still you don't put it in, but you need to. You can develop that into an entire matrix, right? You can develop that into an entire matrix, right? Just apply that same concept to this place, to that place, to that place. And then all of a sudden, you've mapped out the, <laughs> the deepest lie uh, in history, right? And this is how and why that is like a Scientology religion. Because you believe it, right? And not only that, there are other things that come along with that. Right now, you've you've extrapolated this concept that since there are these other places in this deep, vast universe. Now, there's the the very next logical step after that is: Did life emerge on any of these other planets? And if it did, it must be greater than we are because we didn't know about them. You see what I'm saying? And they may know about us or their information may be different from ours. We've made all of these different mistakes. Maybe they're perfect, right? Now, next next thing you know, maybe they're gods. Maybe they're the gods instead of what the Bible says, instead of what we know to be true, right? Maybe it was them and not him, right? A competing religion, because remember space, if space is not there, it's heaven, right? If you believe that it's millions and billions of miles of nothing, where's heaven? Instead, there's a partition, and on the opposite side of that partition, heaven sits, as does Elohim, right? We know that to be true, but then imagine to yourself how to lie your way out of where you live. Because the biggest proof that Elohim exists is the environment that you live in. If you live in what can cons be considered to be a fish bowl for humans, a human bowl, then it's kind of hard to say that there is no Elohim. 
but the religion of the new age, the new era, <clears throat> the belief in around earth, the belief in space has to have a God. And the gods at the center of it, you know, are the extraterrestrials, are the aliens, the ones that may or may not show up, right? And if they do show up, you know, automatically they need to be trusted and believed because they got to be smarter than we are, right? And then if we're trusting them and believing them, then how different from that is worship, right? Is being a servant to them, right? And then <laughs> if you see that narrative unfolding, how far is it to believe that these aren't the entities that have always been around, which the Bible talks about in the first place, right? The ones that have been trying to trick you for thousands of years already, that have been conniving and, and creating all of these dirty tricks in order to get you to not look at the Bible. You know, that wouldn't, that narrative wouldn't fit, would it? And so this is what you can see at the end of the world and at the end of the world. People believe that we've been here in even America, and we're not in America, we're Africa. But people think that we've been believing that the earth was round for just a huge amount of time, right? It's not the case. People started, yeah, the belief that the earth was flat and that there was a dome over top of the earth was the prevalent belief system, regardless of all of these scientific theories, all the way up until the 1900s. You had people doing experiments all over the world. You had people saying, all oh, these scientists are full of crap. All over the world, they were not believed at all. You know, uh, they, they, people would have you believe that, oh, you know, the earth being flat was, was disproven back in the 1500s and people have been believing differently ever since then. It's not the truth. People started believing differently when the space program started. That's it. And that's only been about 80, 90 years ago, right? How long has the space program, well, you know, since Sputnik and all that, when people started doing the high orbit, what is that, the 40s, 50s, 50s? Let's just say the 50s. So that's 70 years, right? So that's been 70 years ago. People have been believing in the Earth being round, um, for about 75 years, about a hundred years. That's not a long time. That's not a long time at all. The majority of the people on the planet believe that it was flat a hundred years ago. You gotta understand that, that these scientific communities in Europe are not the entire world. That these, these rich, you know, uh, people got a hold of the propaganda, got a hold of the press. And through the press, we're able to change history. You have to know that our ancestors didn't believe in no round earth. They believed in the firmament in the sky. Do you see what I'm saying? People were not convinced, but not yet, not yet. People were not convinced by the things that they were saying, right? The religion did not take hold until this era, this era. The religion did not take hold until the modern era. <laughs> you hear, in one of my videos, you've got in Germany, <laughs> the, the Olympics, right? The Nazi Olympics in 1936, right? With Adolf Hitler, uh, like, orchestrating it, right? You guys don't know the history behind all of this. All of these different groups and people are connected, right? And they all know each other and are working together and apart at the same time. But, and that's the only way that you can have a Nazi Olympics, right? So the Nazi Olympics in 1936, right? Hitler announced the beginning of a new world era, right? A new world of science. What do you think he was announcing? What, did you think he know, knew what was coming? You know, all these evil people working together. Did you think that the plan may have been slipped into him at some point when he announces the the start of the world religion? You can you can look at it at about 1936 when people started believing in technology more than they did each other, more than they did the scripture. 
when the world mentality began to change around that time, right? Around that time. If you want to mark a date for when the new religion took over, you could mark it at about the time that Hitler said it would, right? And this, you know, Scientology-based religion was developed and implemented through Nazis, through America, through NASA, and through all of this different propaganda that's come out since then. And, you know, he somehow knew it would come. Because, of course, all of these same entities are tied in together, right? And don't, don't think that the entities are not real because the aliens exist, except they're from Earth and they've been here already. Because see, people don't understand that there's two types of beings on Earth. People don't understand that Satan's not in hell. Satan's on Earth and he's got his angels with him, right? And not only them, but also demons. And they're not made out of flesh and blood. They're made out of spirit, out of breath, out of air, out of energy. And a being like that can appear and not and still be there, right? And so when you have an entity like that, which scientists can't even begin to comprehend because they're studying only physical things, not spiritual things, which we know to exist, the energetic things, energetic beings is not a concept that is, you know, unlikely. An energetic consciousness is what we have in our mind already. It's just interpreted by, by your brain, right? So it just follows that that same electrical energy doesn't necessarily need a body, right? So just logically, we should be able to scientifically prove that spirits exist. But if we can't, <laughs> then we know from history, from the, the thousands, hundreds of thousands of inter interactions with them that we have on file on record, right? Right? And from that, we know that there are two different types of beings on the face of the earth. Ones that are made out of flesh and ones that are made out of spirit. Just think if those ones that were invisible and made out of spirit were able to convince you that they did not exist, then what would you do? You would turn around and make yourself be seen and say you were God, right? That's what you would do. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing aliens showing up and saying they're the gods, right? In propaganda, in film, in accounts, right, from abduction victims, right? It's just these other beings that are on the same planet with us that we've been convinced that don't exist, right? That's the new religion of the new era. And you gotta get out of it. <laughs> if you get out of that religion, it seems silly, right? Once you understand the earth is flat, all this hocus pocus billions of years of space black holes string theory m theory the multiplicity of worlds what type of aliens what type of carbon based silicone based what type of intelligence what type of craft what type of conversation all of that disappears and they become the spiritual entities that we always knew that they were it sounds like it's time to eat y'all Shalom, shalom.